we have two conference and then some summary. Some Good afternoon. We are going to start our afternoon session. We have two conference and then some summary, some closing remarks to start the collaboration that we are supposed to start after this, the summit and the conference. Uh, I told Dr. Edna Acosta, she will be the moderator of this session. We are going to be on time until 3.30 uh, before the networking are going to be in the same place of the lunch. Uh, remember the evaluation forms. And remember, if anyone wants to participate tomorrow in the collaborative groups, to let uh, the people of the registration table know which group. Uh, Dr. I hope you have enjoyed and you enjoyed the food and the weather. It's quite quite humid today, as you can see. Um, let me talk a little bit of joys and the joy is more better while everyone joins us. Um, she is a psychiatrist, epidemiologist, and a health educator. What a great combination, right? Three great disciplines together, just in one little person. She is an assistant professor of the Department of Health Science Research, and more importantly, for time for my career, uh, at the director of the Center of Clinical and Translational Research Science, Office of Community Engagement in Research at Mayo Clinic. Rochester, obviously. She completed her postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Florida in health equity and uh, epidemiology, the PhD in health education at the University of Toledo, and a, and a master in psychiatric epidemiology from Washington University School of Medicine. Her research focused on community engagement with an emphasis on disease prevention, health promotion, and behavioral change. This on, the, on an application of community engagement research across the translational spectrum of, of clinical research. She has established the major clinic community engagement research advisory board that seeks to ensure that community engaged and community placed research at major clinic is of high quality, respects of community values, and benefits community members as well. So we are trying to mimic a little bit of the work she's doing there with a, a, a similar group, a similar body of community leaders that are gonna be helping the Puerto Rico Clinical and Translational Research Consortium as a advisory community board. Lastly, she has been developing training opportunities for residents and other medical fellows and she has transferred that same skills to community members and to enhance community, to enhance community engagement in research at Mayo Please give a big applause to Joyce Walter. Hello everyone, I'm kind of short, so hopefully you can see me behind the podium. <laughs> One of my mentors said to me that maybe I should always stand to the side, because if I took my shoes off, you really wouldn't be able to see me. <laughs> um, my name again is Joyce Falls Berry. Um, everyone calls me Joy outside of work. I just go by Joy Berry, because I think that's a fun name to go by. And plus, my husband's like, why did you keep your other last name? So. <laughs> I don't have any disclosures um, and any other commercial relationships to report. 
So I'm going to give you a quick overview about what we're going to talk about today. Today, I'm going to provide a little bit of foundation about health disparities research so that we're all talking the same language. I know that many of you already know what health disparities and health equity is. I'm also going to describe a little bit about capacity building, collective impact, and community action models. And I'm also going to introduce the model of health disparities and community engagement and research opportunities that we now have at Mayo Clinic and explain our model for health disparities and community engagement and research training that we do have at the clinic and then give some um, examples of research and action. So I really like these two quotes. The first is from Dr. Martin Luther King and he said, of all the forms of inequality, and injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. And this quote is from the mid-1960s, and we're still there, you know? And so, and that's before I was born. I'll be 40 in June, probably. And so, and I asked my parents, my, I'm in my father's field, I said, is this still true? And he was a health commissioner, and he said yes. You know, and he started his career right around the time that this quote was actually stated. And before my dad's time, Hippocrates said, healing is a matter of time, but it's also sometimes a matter of opportunity. And we're seeing that today around the world when we think about the opportunities that we have to enhance our health, to improve the research process, and to be thoughtful about health care. You know, these are things that are still apparent. So one of the things that I also think is really important is thinking about the foundation of diversity. And diversity impacts every aspect of our health, from health care to access to care to even research. And we need to be open to diversity and realize that our world is changing, which allows us to be open to understanding the issues that may place each of us at risk for a variety of health conditions. I don't know if you can see the small caption underneath there. But this cartoon is from 1963, so right around the same time when Dr. King uh, gave the quote, and it says at the bottom, Joe, these people say they want flesh-colored band-aids. <laughs> so this, this slide is, um, is a slide that I borrowed from one of my mentors, Dr. Eddie Green, who some of you may know. And Dr. Green had two questions on there. He said, will better health care be increasingly demanded by diverse populations? And how can we ready ourselves to deliver the best health care to all flawlessly? But then I ask another question, is how do we prepare researchers to work with diverse populations? Because if we're not having the conversation about diversity, our world is changing. So how do we know that the interventions that we're developing, the research processes that we're creating will be impactful for the community and that the community is a part of that process? So health disparities and health equity has a variety of definitions, but there's some things that are really in common with them. And that is that many compare non-minorities to minority groups. Sometimes comparisons are done to the general population. And sometimes comparisons are done with different segments of the populations and somewhat may not um, even identify a comparison group. And when we think about healthcare disparities, this refers to the differences of the availability of the facilities and services to all. So when we consider different ways of trying to understand health disparities, we sometimes think about prevention um, efforts and treatment options, which should be made available to reduce or eliminate specific disease. And we also sometimes even think about some common approaches for examining health disparities like epidemiology studies, studies which are more quantitative and focused. I'm an epidemiologist by training, so I count and sort. You know, either a person has a disease or they don't. Either you're at risk for a disease or you're not. You know, there's no gray areas. But in the field of health education, I learned that there is some gray areas. So a person might have a disease or might be at risk for something, but how do we know the why? or what impedes them for better health care without asking other questions that are more qualitative and perspective. So with epidemiology studies, we can examine trends in morbidity and mortality, incidence and prevalence, and even use statistical approaches. But then we need to think about the community's needs and their assets, assets and resources that they may have that can um, impact the health for all. So the Rockefeller Foundation came up with five steps to measuring health disparities that I really liked. 
They said that we need to define what we're measuring. So are we measuring access to care? Are we measuring mortality? Are we measuring disability? We need to identify which groups we're looking at based on gender or sex or education or other social demographic characteristics. We also need to choose a reference group, which is the group that we're comparing people to. So African Americans to another population. Um, we need to decide will the measure be absolute or relative differences and decide on the number of characteristics that will be measured. Like some um, earlier today, we heard that there was a paper that, that looked at 256 health disparities. So of those 256, which ones were the most appropriate to actually measure? Were there some themes that came out that those 256 uh, areas could be grouped in? Possibly. So how do we determine what's the most appropriate to measure? <laughs> it's not for him. <laughs> and then we also need to select our social weights. And this is not as important because it's, it's, it, it is important, but maybe not as important as some of the other areas as well. So when we think about the different models to clarify health disparities, these are some of the most common ones that, that you'll see in the literature. The race and genetic model, um, here, race is not genetic, but is, is genetic, not phenotypic, and it has little power. The health behavior model is essentially that. What behaviors do we do personally that might impact our, our risk for different diseases? Um, the social economic, that social economic status model, where health disparities is confounded by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. The psychological and stress model, which stressors are associated with institutional as well as interpersonal racism causes health disparities. And then there's also the structural conservative model, which takes into account race and ethnicity as, a social, as social categories. So there was another um, framework that was created. Um, this was published back in 2006. And the thing that I liked about this framework, it provides us um, as health service researchers and even practitioners and policy makers with a way of thinking about health disparities research in terms of the spectrum. So there are three different phases. In the phase one, this is the information stage. For, from an epidemiologist perspective, this is like looking at the etiology of, of the disparities that are out there. So taking that 256 health disparities and saying, okay, this is the laundry list of everything that's there. Phase two studies really want to understand the why. So now we know these, so why do they exist? And then phase three really takes into concepts of what Dr. Mountain was talking about earlier today is the interventions that are, that are geared toward reducing or eliminating health disparities. So now that we kind of have the groundwork on how I see health disparities in our societies, I want to talk a little bit about capacity building and other approaches that are used to reduce health disparities. In 2001, so this is a, an older paper, but it's one of the sentinel papers about uh, capacity building. And this model um, focuses on the vision and missions of nonprofit organizations. So capacity building usually is not always done in the academic setting. It started off in community-based organizations in the nonprofit realm. But there's some lessons learned there for us as we partner with these groups to improve community health. So it looks at the leadership of the nonprofit boards, their staff, their volunteers, the available resources like money and other finances, as well as technology and the human capital. It also examines outreach efforts like dissemination, public education opportunities, collaboration and advocacy, and the products and services that are provided as it relates to the outputs and the outcomes and the performances of the nonprofits that are trying to build capacity. Um, the model suggests that we need to determine the basic needs and assets of the community, access the number and types of nonprofit organizations in the community through a mapping process, identify the infrastructure that can be used to build the nonprofit capacity, select appropriate capacity building strategies, and monitor, monitor and assess the progress of the periodic on a periodic basis. So it looks at sustainability, social capital, as well as civil society, and theories centered in organizational and development and management. There's another approach that was also published in around 2000 or 2001, 
uh, by Trisk, and he said that there was four approaches to capacity building. There's a top-down approach, which happens when, the, um, when we restructure an organization to fit the needs of the changing community. It could be renaming the organization, or even revamping the board, or even um, evaluating the strategic focus of the organization. The bottom-up process allows for training opportunities to increase the skills of nonprofit members to address the needs of the communities in which they serve. The opportunity, um, the partnership model, rather, um, looks at opportunities for groups that may not necessarily always work together to work together. So think about the University of Puerto Rico and Mayo Clinic. We are two nonprofit organizations, but we found a way to jointly address the needs of our learners, of our research community, and to provide a, a mechanism that can change both societies. And then we can also think of, of the other perspective of capacity building, which is community organizing, which refers to the collaboration, the collaborative process of a variety of groups working together for a common goal. So when we think about capacity building, one of the other things that we, that I think is also important to consider is collective impact. When we think about um, collective impact versus isolation, isolation, it means that funders choose what individual grantees will do. Nonprofit organizations work in silos. Um, the evaluation focuses only on that one organization that received the funding and one organization is responsible for large-scale um, change, and the government and cooperative areas work in silos. Whereas collective impact is when several organizations come together to identify the concerns, and they take those back to the funders and people that implement change, and they look at the same goals, and they look at similar measures, and they also think about cross-sector alignment and co-learning. So we each have a different way of doing things. So how can we work together? Because we do have insider and outsider challenges. Mayo Clinic, for instance, we have a way that we like to operate. University of Puerto Rico has a way that, that you all like to operate. So how can we work to, collectively to make sure that we're talking the same language? And there's even language barriers, too, English and Spanish. So, and my Spanish is un poquito. <laughs> so multiple organizations um, also share their lessons learned, and the government and corporate areas also partner together under collective impact. So it has five different conditions. There needs to be a common agenda where all partners have a shared vision. There needs to be a shared measurement way, so data collection processes and results should be consistent. That there should be a multiple way of reinforcing the activities that are being done. And they have to be distinguished from each other, but be coordinated in a way to commit each other. So if you think about an R1 grant that has multiple partners. So because you have this R1 grant, you might not collect all of your data the same way, but there needs to be a way of, com of comparing that data collectively. We also have to have a continuous communication, being open and consistent with how we communicate, and even having, as Dr. Gabriel mentioned earlier today, being willing to have those tough conversations about things because being transparent in our communication process uh, will allow us to move forward in a way that's thoughtful. And then there's also going to be one organization that is going to serve as the backbone of, of any um, initiative. So for instance, uh, there's opportunities for our learners, uh, for your learners from University of Puerto Rico to come to Mayo Clinic to learn about health disparities and other work that we're doing in translational science. So Mayo Clinic is responsible for making sure that those students' training opportunities are the best for those six to eight weeks that they're there, you know, because we want them to be able to come back. And so University of Puerto Rico is the backbone of sending the students, and Mayo is serving another purpose as well. So this is an example. So there are three phases of collective impact. Phase one is the initial phase where the partners meet and they determine um, their strategic plan and they think about how they can work together and what their infrastructure is in governance. Phase two is organizing for impact and this is thinking about the involvement of the community in that process. And then phase three is the um, sustainability, sustainability of the actions and what overall impact has happened in the community. So when we think about, there's another model that I also like called the Community Action Model, which has five steps. This is, a, 
the first step is skill-based training. So we all have different skills, but if we want to work collectively on a project, we need to make sure that we're, we're talking about the same skills and are, are really moving forward in a way where we have co-learning. Then the next step is action-based research. All of the models that I've mentioned um, previously have an action or action-oriented. Um, there's also a data analysis uh, section, so we have to collect data and then think about ways of ana analyzing it. And then think about how policy change can really impact health and how can we implement the changes that we've um, selected. So at Mayo Clinic, we do have some opportunities to, um, to provide information to researchers and learners about health disparities as well as community engagement and research. Um, so I wanted to mention a few of those to you. The first is a newly formed office, uh, the Office of Health Disparities Research, which is not part of our CTSA. It is a separate office that is funded by um, our research um, shield. And they uh, support meaningful research that has been identified, developed, and employed strategies to eliminate and reduce health disparities. So they encourage the establish um, to, they encourage and establish the importance of health disparities research across the enterprise via a different award mechanism and educational efforts as well as an annual meeting. And they also identify and help deliver applicable resources available within Mayo Clinic to conduct health disparities research, such as our biobank, our survey research center, our bioethics um, area. Um, the office for which I direct, which is the Office of Community Engagement and Research, as well as several of others. Um, the Office of Health Disparities Research is headed by David Warner, um, who many of you know, um, and Gloria Peterson, and the program manager is Dr. Sameda Penhire. So when we think about the research process, um, before I talk about community-engaged research, which is the area that I, that I love, we know what traditional research is. Traditional research, we as investigators, we define the problem, then we decide where we're going to collect the data, if we're going to use work with a community organization, if there's other skills that we need to gain as investigators, and how we're going to control the data and all the resources that we collect, how we're going to interpret it, and then guess what? We own it. It's ours. Whereas community-engaged research is more thoughtful, um, so research with the community is we, we work with the community or in the community. Um, the community is our partner. People versus participants, they're not subjects, they're participants. Um, community organizations may help recruit participants and serve on a, an advisory capacity. Researchers gain skill and we gain knowledge from the community overall. And we control, researchers control the research where the community representatives may help us make some minor decisions. And researchers do own the data and we decide how we use it and disseminate it back. Whereas community-based participatory research is a, is a little more in depth. The community identifies the problem and works with the researchers to identify the problem. We work with the community as a full partner people as participants and collaborators. And then the community organizers um, are partners in the research process and the research with the community together to build the community capacity. And the researcher and the community share control equally of the data. And the data is shared and the researchers come and the community decide its use and dissemination. So there are 12 principles to community engagement and research. We need to be clear. We need to know what the norms and values are of the community. We need to build trust. We need to also look at self-determination and collective um, impact. And we need to think about the community as a partner and re recognize and respect their cultural views. We need to also define the, the terms of engagement and how we like to engage. Think about sustainability and have an agree or disagree on expectations and outcome and have a clear timeline and budget and be prepared to release control of the data. Um, and we also need to think about community collaborations, which require a long-term commitment. So when we think about translational science, um, it usually starts off with lab discoveries, and then it goes to patient-centered outcomes. And then there are delivery to patients and communities. But we want to be able to close back that loop if you look at the arrows that are on the bottom, where we can take what the community knows, take it back to the patient-centered researchers, 
who can also take it back to the lab, lab discovery or basic science researchers. And the way to do that is to be community engaged. So the Office of Community Engagement and Research, we're aligned with the value of Mayo Clinic. And our mission is to enhance the value of clinical and translational science by promoting engagement with pertinent stakeholder communities through education, practice, and research. And that is a feature of my team. Um, the woman with the glasses on, she's no longer with us, and I'm actually in the process of hiring her replacement now, and I was really sad when she left. Um, community engagement and research is more engaging. It is not a passive process. And then we did establish a community um, advisory board, and our board assists, um, it's called the Community Engagement Research Advisory Board, and they assist to ensure that all community engaged in place research at Mayo Clinic is of high quality, respects community values, and benefits community members. Um, our model at Mayo Clinic is that um, community engagement is not an adjective to research, that we want to make sure that community engagement and research is the norm, and there are six stakeholder communities that we're really interested in working with. Public, the patients, physicians, and other healthcare providers, and other providers, payers, policymakers, regulatory agents, and peer scientists. So when we're preparing our learners to reduce health disparities, the Mayo model um, is, is kind of unique, because the learners that we have are not typical students. They're faculty and allied health staff, they're fellows, they're residents, they're PhD students, they're post baccalaureate students and other trainees at Mayo, and even other institutions. And I mentioned some of the programs that we have at university, with the University of Puerto Rico. We do have um, the first course in health disparities, which was the brainchild of Dr. Eddie Green, and it was the Introduction to Health Disparities course, which provided an overview of health disparities in the form of a seminar-based class. This class used to have a cross-cultural communication workshop. And based on um, some surveying of the students, it was decided to revamp the, the course slightly. And so we revised the course to call it What Researchers Need to Know About Eliminating Health Disparities, and these are the learning objectives. Um, based on, on the change, we have, it's still a seminar-based course that meets six sessions for about an hour of lecture, with, followed by a couple of student presentations. Um, it's a one credit hour course, we're on a quarter system at Mayo. And learners gain an understanding of framework on shaping the policies for the inclusion of minorities and underrepresented communities in the research process. And it's a didactic lectures and class discussions as well as paper presentations. One of the highlights of the course is that the learners actually get an opportunity to publish um, as in the class, so they write letters to the editors. And the letters to the editors are submitted to journals, um, and about 90% of those that have been submitted have been published, which means that they actually gain something from a class project, which is very different. Um, so we did change, the, we revised the learning objectives. We, we did an evaluation called Keep, Start, Do. And then based on those rec rec recommendations, we added additional co topics to a second course that we have, and we plan to revamp some of the assignments that we have. And so this is the word cloud mm -hmm. from the do mm -hmm. evaluation. And as you can see, they really like discussions. They like that letter to the editorial assignment. The mandatory that you see, big and blue, we had a mandatory Facebook thing. They hated it. <laughs> hated it, but for other classes, they love Facebook. But this one, not so much. Um, the word cloud for the start, again, they wanted more discussions. Some of the students didn't like doing presentations, but you and I, we all know that this is the time, the, this is the best way for them to learn how to present is in the classroom. Um, they liked some of the lectures, and they, they loved the article uh, assignment. And then what did they want us to do? They wanted us to do more action-based research, and they wanted it to have some policy um, information and then LGBTI issues also came up. So our advanced topic extends, um, which is the second course in health disparities, it expands on the topics covered in that first course, and those are learning objectives for that class. We do look at culture and religion and spirituality. Um, we also identify some of the leading research approaches to health disparities, and we did keep the letter to the editor assignment in this course as well, which gives them a second opportunity to publish and added um, a research plan um, to that to the mix. 
Then we have another course, which is not only focused on health disparities, but it's focused on all, a variety of types of translational science, and that's what every researcher should know about community-engaged research. And this is an introductory course which explores the research approaches used to build bi-directional research relationships. And students are able to gain an understanding of community-engaged research principles, describe some issues around research ethics, working with the community, describe the methods that are commonly used, and understand how community-engaged research can be used in a variety of areas across the translational science spectrum. Um, the cross-cultural communication workshop that was originally in the 5080 course, we moved it to this class because it was a better fit. And the learners were provided an opportunity to explore their perceptions and values around diverse communities. Um, they practice interacting with different community members in a, in a simulation. And all actors that participate in this workshop are underrepresented community <coughs> members. We also have a partnership that we call PERI, per, the PERI Partnership, which is an effort um, with other academic institutions in the Midwest of the US to um, share courses related to health disparities in rural and American, in American Indian communities. And there are, those are the courses that are there. And the courses from Mayo, um, all three of those courses are part of the Prairie Initiative. And we're currently evaluating um, the program and determining our next steps. So some examples. How much time do I have on over? Yeah, just do 10 minutes. 10 minutes? OK, so we're good. So I have a few more slides. So some examples of community engagement and research in action. And these are some of our current projects. Um, the Project Here study is a study that I'm the, co the, co uh, the PI of um, with a colleague of mine from the University of Minnesota in Rochester. But what's interesting about the project, even though there's two academic partners, this project was the spearhead of the church community. They came to us and said, hey, there's a problem. We have several members in our congregation that have been diagnosed with breast and cervical cancer. What can we do about it? So we wanted to look at, we know that black women have a higher mortality rate for breast and cervical cancer compared to our white counterparts. We also know that Rochester, Minnesota has a variety of options to reduce deaths from cancer. But black women, we sometimes are un unaware of the services that are available to us. So Vision Church said, can you help? The pastor of this church is actually a social worker by training. So he, he's seeing the women, not only in his congregation, but also in his day job. So we, what we decided to do was we wanted to determine the barriers and facilitators to healthcare utilization as it relates to cancer, prevention health services, like screening and treatment among black women in Rochester. And we didn't just say African-American women, because Rochester's uh, black community is more diverse than that. We have Somali, Sudanese, and Caribbean communities. And so we wanted to make sure that we were inclusive. Uh, we also wanted to identify methods that um, our community, because the other research is also a black woman as well, um, and Rochester preferred to receive dissemination of health information as it relates to cancer. And so we took a community-engaged research approach. We did focus groups, and so far we've done nine focus groups, and we've had 45 women participate in our groups. Um, and we're using a dissemination as intervention research method where we're actually going to take our study findings next month back to the community and present them back to them and do an educational event on site at the public library. Because in expanding the black community to also include Somali women and Sudanese women, some of those women weren't comfortable going to a church for an educational session. So the public library in Rochester has a wellness corner, mm -hmm. and so we're partnering with the wellness corner and the students that house that to provide the educational session. So the findings from that study I'm hoping will be useful to our community and give us another method of providing education and reducing health disparities. Then there is a group that was started um, called the Community Alliance of Rochester for Equality. And this group was started by the team that I showed you the pictures of, as well as several um, CBOs or community-based organizations in our community. Many of our community-based organizations um, don't have strong board structures. Many of them don't have a method of evaluating the work that they're doing. And, but they found that if they work together collectively, 
they actually might be able to apply for different types of funding opportunities and impact health disparities and health equity in a very different way, and hence the founding of CARE. And CARE is a nonprofit organization, and it, the group uses the community capacity building model with a collective impact approach. And so um, they just received their first um, amount of funding, and $10,000 is a lot of money to this community, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we're also in the process of writing up several other grants, which will bring more money to the organization so that they can can have a greater impact because without dollars, you can't do anything. And that's, it's, it's harder to do things, rather. So another thing that we helped with um, in Olmstead County was, Olmstead County is where Mayo Clinic is located. We assisted, we being OCER, assisted with the collection of data for our county health needs assessment. And this was done in collaboration with other partners at Mayo Clinic, Olmstead County Public Health, Olmstead Medical Center, as well as the United Way and some other community-based organization. They used a mixed methods approach. They did medical record abstraction. So just like that 256 indicators for health disparity, they found a whole lot of them. They were like, oh gosh, well, what are we gonna do with this? So then they also did a survey of the community, but the survey was um, interesting. Rochester is not 90% white, but their survey responders were 93% white which meant a large portion of our community was not reached. It was a telephone survey, and so even people that, that are like me, I don't own a, a house phone, I use my cell phone. My husband uses his cell phone. So they wouldn't have reached us with a random digit dial. So they said, okay, well how can we hear the voices from other community members? So we came up with a strategy that we call community health listening sessions and interviews, where we went out in the community, only gave us like three to four weeks to collect the data. We did six, focus group-like sessions with different community-based organizations who are part of CARE. And then we also went to an international festival and did interviews at the international festival. And so that data um, helped them determine the five leading health concerns, which were diabetes, mental health, obesity, housing, and homelessness, as well as tobacco. And so data is being distributed back to the communities now to determine how with the community implementation plan, how to address those concerns. So, in conclusion, <laughs> there are a variety of approaches that we can use to, to uh, study health disparities. However, approaches that use a community-engaged research process may be more promising because they engage a variety of pertinent stakeholders. Capacity building is one of the foundations that is needed to sustain programs that are appropriate to reduce health disparities. The Mayo model for health disparities and community engagement and research training provides us the chance for diverse learners to work together to learn new research processes. The examples of health disparities and community engagement and research and action shows how multiple disciplinary teams can work together to address the community's needs. And our next steps are to evaluate our programs as well as our research process. So I'd like to thank the conference planning committee and the summit and as well as our, um, the collaborative endowment planning team for providing the opportunity to speak. Um, I'd also like to give a special thank, to, thank you to my colleagues at Mayo Clinic and namely um, my staff and, and CCATS, um, OCER. And then again, this presentation was made possible by you all here at UPR, as well as our, our CCAS um, training grant. Thank you. We have the item. Thank you for that magnificent um, presentation, so enthusiastic. Um, we have five minutes for questions, so anyone or comments? There's one back there. Yes. So uh, Rochester, you know, Rochester is about, we read about 106,000 people, and about 30,000 plus, Mayo employs about 54, 59,000 people. In Rochester, we employ about 30 to 40,000 people, so about half of the community work at the clinic, or they're connected to somebody at the <coughs> clinic. But then there are other groups that aren't. And so the public library realized that we have a homelessness problem. 
And many times they'll come there to hang out to stay warm. And one of the librarians got to talking to a few people and she was like, well, do you have some place to go for health care? Do you have access to certain things that you need? Do you know where the shelters are? And all of these other things. And she and some of the other librarians decided to apply for a Blue Foundation, the Blue Cross and Blue Shields Foundation, for a grant. They didn't think they were going to get the funding, but guess what happened? They did. And so it was written in partnership with Winona State as well, um, which is a university um, not too far from, 30 minutes from us? About 30 minutes or so from us. And so um, in partnership with their nursing program. And so it's, it's staffed by nursing students. And the students go and they have a little room, which used to be a conference room, where they do BMI, they get BMI data, they do blood pressures, they can do some some other basic test. And then they also serve as a um, conduit, for lack of a better word, or a community health worker to refer um, the community members to the services that they need so they don't have to fill out so many paperwork and things like that. And so that's the wellness corner. But now they're trying to expand to offer other health opportunities. So our project here study is going to be the first time that they actually have like a um, a research study coming back to disseminate study findings to the community there. Any other questions? Comments? No, I don't have one. <laughs> I have one question. Okay, I might be able to answer it. <laughs> of course. Well, um, my preparation is in social community psychology, mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy for me to go and approach a community, but it's not the same for other disciplines. What other recommendation besides training? Well, mm -hmm. Training would be excellent. Do you recommend to um, researchers to take that first step to go and try to spread their work to the community? Okay, so I'm going to go back to this slide. Mm -hmm. So the, there are different principles for community-based participatory research. There's like eight of them. And they're really cool and they're really great, but we needed to expand on that. So as you're approaching the community, um, really think about what are your expectations of the partnership? Or if the community comes back to you, you have to be clear. Like, I can do this, but I can't do that. So I'll give you a, a, a good example. Uh, Mayo Clinic, we provide a lot of um, funding opportunities to some community-based organizations through our community contribution program. When I stepped in as director of the office, everybody said, oh my God, this is another way for us to get funding from Mayo. We don't do that. So I had to be very clear with our community groups that we were going to be working with that we don't have money either, so how can we work together to change the health of our community? Then we also have to think about the community's norms. So another example would be our Project Here study. So once we expanded to include women from the Somali and the Sudanese community, we had to think about the fact that these groups might not be Christian-based, even though the, um, the program started off in a Christian community. So how can we also help these women as well? And then all of those things help to build trust. You show up on time, you do what you say you're going to do, and then the community, guess what? They'll do what they say they're going to do. And if they don't, it's okay. You say, is anything going on? And you keep that open communication. And then self-determination, determining where you, where you stand and what your strengths are. And, and then making sure that we remember to partner with the community, that, they're, that they are the, the keepers of their knowledge and we are the keepers of ours. But how do we give that information back to each other? And then recognize and respect the community's cultures. Define and determine the roles of engagement and even the expectations of the engagement. So for instance, when I go and talk to a community group, I tell them, look, I will help you with, with the things that you all definitely need if I can. If I can't, then we'll think together how we can find out to get the resources that you need, but I also need help from you. And by saying that, it lets them know what my expectations are and theirs as well. And then that's also helped to increase sustainability because I say, okay, we're gonna do this one project, but what do we wanna do next? So it's always thinking about that next step. And then um, being clear about the expectations and even the timeline. 
because with, with researchers, the community wants stuff right away. Okay, you collected this data, what are you doing back? But in our world, it takes us time to analyze the data, it takes time to write the papers, it takes time for us to prepare, and it might be a year or two before that publication comes out. So, and then um, be prepared to release control back to the community, and then um, re remember that it takes a long time and commitment. Thank you. Now we're going to have our last presentation before the panel discussion that will be about 30 minutes at the end. And we're going to, yes, I call Baga, she's going to moderate the session, and present our next speaker. Good afternoon. Good to see everybody awake after lunch. Um, I am honored to present our next uh, speaker. Her name is Dr. Milagros Rosal. I met Dr. Rosal last year when she came uh, to give us a talk also and to work with one of our scholars because she is the mentor of Ada Castro, one of our scholars of the postdoctoral master. Dr. Milagros Rosal is a professor in the Division of Preventive, Preventive and Behavioral Medicine of the Department of Medicine in UMass. She has been there for 20 years. She is co-director of the CDC-funded UMass Worcester Prevention Research Center and co-PI of the NIMHD-funded Center for Health Equity Intervention Research. Dr. Rosal has been the principal investigator and co-leader of more than 30 research studies, most federally funded. She specializes in the design of behavioral intervention targeting health behaviors related to obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease prevention and management. He has particular expertise in tailoring of intervention to cultural, linguistic, and literacy needs of underserved and minority populations in, and in the conduct of randomized clinical trials in the community setting. Most of her work has been in Latino health, and when she came last year, I was very impressed in the intervention that she did with this Latino community, uh, community and the outcome she has uh, taken from that. So uh, we're trying to upload her presentation, but uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Rosal. Um, it 
brings the issue of um, how um, do we address the uh, fact that the population is becoming more and more diverse and diversity in many ways. Um, so diversity may be socioeconomic, it may be racial, ethnic, um, it may be uh, a number of things. So I'm, I'm going to get there. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. So um, the first, um, um, the, the main objectives of the presentation is I am going to uh, review uh, the progression of uh, research in the translation continuum, which um, is uh, something that uh, several of the speakers have already um, talked about. Um, and within that uh, context, I am going to uh, then move to um, uh, the model and methodologies that uh, I, have, I have used in my work on um, translating an efficacious intervention um, to test the effectiveness of, of this translation in a, um, a in a community setting, uh, which is the WIC program. I don't know um, how many people are familiar with the WIC program. It's the Women, Infant, and Children's program. Okay, so there's two. Okay. Um, so um, I will be focusing on um, that. Um, the discussion of that study um, on um, low-income uh, women um, during their postpartum period and way off during that time. So um, we all know that uh, observational studies are very important, and um, observational studies uh, give us um, uh, clues as to what to look for in, um, in future work. So we know in terms of um, obesity, that um, uh, the trend in obesity um, has increased and continues to increase. Um, uh, in 1990, there were um, basically no states that had uh, obesity rates uh, more than 15%. And um, we know that that is completely different now. We know that um, there are many states that now have uh, the rates of uh, above 25, and, and some have uh, rates of obesity of uh, above 30 percent, as you saw before in the slides that uh, another presenter um, had that has been reflected in uh, rates of diabetes and um, other diseases. Um, we also know that um, diet, physical activity, and excess weight uh, are among the um, um, most preventable. Um, causes of death in the United States. Uh, this particular report in 2009 um, uh, found that out of uh, 2.5 million deaths in, in the United States in 2005, um, most of, the cause of those preventable causes of death were related to behaviors. And um, obviously smoking um, was right up there at uh, 450,000 deaths, and the rest are all related to diet, physical activity, or lack of physical activity and um, excess weight obesity. So knowing um, that that is what um, the observational studies um, tell us, uh, the next step is what do we do about it? And um, that is where the um, efficacy studies come into place. So the question is, do changing diet, physical activity, and weight does that make a, 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 an impact? So one of those studies, uh, efficacy studies, was the Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a um, randomized uh, clinical trial uh, nationwide. It, um, uh, the, the main hypothesis was whether weight loss and physical activity would um, decrease the risk of, a bit of type 2 diabetes among uh, people who were at high risk um, for, uh, for this condition. So as, a, as an efficacy study showed, um, the population was a, a very highly screened population. Um, the, the study um, screened about almost 160,000 people. And um, the screening criteria was very detailed, uh, very costly. And um, uh, then there was a running phase. Um, the study needed to make sure that whoever was recruited was going to be able to participate and engage in the interventions um, that the study was uh, testing. And those interventions were a, a very intensive lifestyle um, intervention for weight loss. 
um, the second uh, intervention was a um, uh, the use of a medication, metformin, which um, is a diabetes medication, and um, in this case, it was to be used for diabetes prevention. And the third arm was um, a uh, standard um, uh, placebo. There was a, a, a fourth arm that uh, was discontinued uh, because of um, mortality in that arm. So um, we know that medication taking and um, diet lifestyle interventions um, uh, have many challenges and adherence is an, a very important challenge. So for um, recruiting into this study, it was very important to make sure that whoever was to participate would be um, able and willing to uh, engage fully in, in the study. So again, very highly selected population. The objective was uh, for people to lose at least 7% of their weight, their body weight, uh, to modify their um, uh, diet to decrease um, um, uh, fat intake and saturated fat as well, and um, to increase their physical activity by 150 minutes a week. And um, as I said, very intensive program, um, highly trained personnel. Again, this study, a uh, very costly study, would, could not happen um, without all these resources being poured to help people engage in the behaviors um, and, and the outcomes like weight loss. <coughs> These were the changes um, that were observed. Um, in the lifestyle intervention, there was a, um, a significant increase in um, uh, physical activity, and um, <coughs> there was uh, pretty much no, change, no, no difference between placebo and metformin. Uh, weight change also um, was significantly um, uh, greater in the lifestyle intervention. Uh, the weight loss um, uh, was greater than in metformin and placebo. And there were um, also changes in um, uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of blood glucose. And um, the, uh, you can see that in the, um, uh, in the curves, um, the lifestyle intervention and metformin uh, in the fourth year um, uh, are, are, are very similar in terms of um, A1C. You, know, you may have observed in the previous slide that weight loss also, uh, despite the initial dip in, in weight, it tended to revert back um, towards the fourth year, um, towards the original uh, weight. Um, despite this um, uh, sort of return to the to, to baseline um, trends, um, we uh, observed in the DPP that the lifestyle intervention reduced the risk of um, uh, developing uh, diabetes by 58% in the lifestyle intervention, 31% uh, um, uh, in the metformin arm uh, compared to uh, the placebo condition. So it was, it was um, it was a, like a very systematic uh, reduction. So, the question of the so what? Um, what do we do with um, uh, this uh, uh, well-developed um, sort of gold standard, um, which is what the, uh, li the lifestyle intervention of, of this program became, a gold standard for what weight loss interventions should have, because people did lose weight, and people did show that um, with the weight loss, um, diabetes uh, uh, could be um, prevented or at least delayed their onset, its onset delay. So we need to um, uh, now consider what are the things that need to be done to adapt this intervention from being appropriate for a very highly selected population to now be implemented in a setting where people um, are experiencing health disparities. Um, in one of the um, uh, live uh, phases uh, for women where women gain um, a significant amount of weight is the childbearing years. Um, a lot of women are gaining in excess of what the um, guidelines for uh, gestational weight gain recommend. 
and um, many women are not losing that weight, um, and some are actually increasing, although uh, this has not um, been quite reported in the literature, but many women, um, especially low-income women, actually increase weight um, after having a baby. Um, we also know that um, even before um, uh, women enter pregnancy, um, uh, almost 60% almost of women um, enter pregnancy overweight or obese, and uh, the rates are higher among uh, low-income populations and uh, certainly Latinos. The average retention rate per pregnancy is about three kilograms 10 years post the index pregnancy. So uh, women who have more than one child are also uh, at greater risk of um, developing obesity because um, women that have not lost their uh, pregnancy weight by six months uh, are likely to maintain their weight and there is a very high association with obesity in later life. So, to answer the so what question, we really need to look at um, uh, community-based uh, research, um, uh, getting, bringing these interventions to the communities, adapting them for their uh, needs, and uh, that can range, that community-based is very, um, um, there is a range of, of possibilities there from um, placing research in the community to engaging the community to uh, uh, informing the research uh, from all aspects um, uh, by members of the community. Um, and in this particular case, um, what we did is uh, we worked with WIC um, from the very beginning for developing all the, all the um, interventions that, that we did. Um, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, the uh, um, DPP sample, the Diabetes Prevention um, Program sample, was a, a very um, diverse population. Actually, half of the population, uh, half of the sample, were uh, groups that experienced high levels of um, disparities in diabetes. So, um, in terms of um, uh, Latinos, there were 16% of Latinos were, um, in the sample. Um, however, when you look at some other demographics, um, especially in the United States, the um, uh, Latino community tends to be uh, of lower income, lower education, um, and have a, a number of other social issues. Um, then you start to see the differences between the DPP and um, the communities that we work with. Um, so for example, in the DPP, um, uh, the majority of the sample, 75, almost 75 percent, were um, had um, above a high school degree. Um, the uh, income levels were above $75,000, and um, in fact, um, half of the sample had an income of over $50,000. And most of them were uh, employed, um, uh, about uh, two-thirds were married, 59% um, had never smoked. It starts to show you uh, the picture. So um, when working with um, uh, the um, WIC program in, 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 Worcester, in the city of Worcester, um, uh, this is a program that is fairly state-funded. Um, as many of you know, they, uh, the program promotes um, uh, healthy nutrition and follows uh, women for um, about six months after delivery and their children for up to five years. So the possibility of reaching um, and being in touch with, with this population of women is great. And um, it is also um, uh, uh, quite um, helpful that the program has, happens to be in all the states and uh, reaches about uh, 18 million individuals. and. Um, uh, unfortunately, the program does not have a weight loss component. So it offers nutrition education, but it does not have a, um, a weight loss services as a, a, as a program, as a federal program. Um, the women um, in the Worcester program in particular are um, uh, numerous. Uh, they are approximately, um, so almost 2,000 women are seen every month. 
and there are, we have four different sites in our city, but there are surrounding cities, cities that have even more. Um, the age range um, tends to be between 18 and, and 38, um, um, at least for the year that we did this study. And uh, many of them are um, Latinas, about a third. Um, and we have, um, you can see that the uh, uh, body mass index and um, uh, the weight gain during pregnancy uh, are problematic, although I actually think these numbers don't capture it all. Um, in the uh, WIC clinics, there have been um, three studies that have tried to address this program, problem in, in, in WIC in the past, and um, two of them uh, were published and had no significant um, benefits and um, in terms of weight loss. And uh, one third study um, was never uh, published. However, even in other populations, weight loss has been difficult um, and more difficult uh, even in um, uh, low income women. So, uh, one of the problems that uh, has been major has been attrition. Um, these women, uh, after having a baby, are extremely busy um, uh, dealing with the baby or their small children plus everything else in life, and um, as I said, none of the studies has shown any benefit. So we built an academic community partnership that included uh, WIF, it included um, um, researchers at UMass. Um, we are in the central uh, part of the state in Massachusetts, and um, it also included the YWCA, and the Worcester Youth Program. So these are organizations that uh, many of the women are familiar with and that WIC and the health centers where uh, WIC operates um, uh, have relationships with. We adapted the um, uh, DPP intervention to be um, uh, more appropriate for this population, we know that attrition um, is, a, is, is a major threat, so we knew that we could not uh, have a Cadillac intervention with uh, 16 uh, weekly sessions, um, uh, with um, uh, additional monthly sessions, and we know that we would lose the women if we uh, went that way. So what we did is we um, uh, worked with three, uh, the three weight clinics that uh, we had at the time, and we um, developed um, um, uh, the, the, uh, a modified intervention that used critical components of the DPP intervention. And um, uh, we did a, a single group design. This was a, a, a real uh, beginning to see what we could do and what we could change. So in this, um, in this process, we uh, selected women who were um, English speaking, and the reason for um, doing this um, uh, for this for this particular pilot is because in Worcester there are a hundred languages spoken. So um, the populations are um, uh, Latinas. Um, there are um, women from um, uh, Africa, African immigrants. Uh, there are uh, Middle Eastern women. Uh, there are women from um, Asia, um, from just about every country. It's, uh, it's an area where there are many refugees, and um, uh, for a beginning, we decided that we needed to uh, control the language uh, factor. Um, and we did, a, um, as I mentioned, a single group design with measures at baseline and at four and, and six months. So um, in this pilot, we had um, 27 women, and um, you can see that the uh, race and ethnicity, education, and um, body mass index look very different than the DPP, the DPP sample. And um, the weight loss um, was, uh, uh, in those four months, was um, uh, about five uh, pounds, five pounds and um, it related to the um, number of sessions that women attended, and it also related to whether they attended the first three sessions or, um, or, or, or didn't, all three. 
So the reason why we looked at that in particular is because, again, we, we were very aware of the threat of uh, losing the women over time. We were testing eight weeks, and an eight week intervention as opposed to a 16 week intervention. And um, with that uh, concern of losing the women, we decided to put the key components of the intervention all in the first three sessions. Um, so, having uh, shown the results now, I'm going to talk about how this intervention was translated. So, the, we call the intervention the Fresh Start Program, and this um, was a um, this was a, uh, a title that came from the women. We, we did uh, uh, focus groups with, with the women, and, and that's what they uh, decided to call the, the program. So um, we used an ecological model, and um, basically what the, um, this uh, social ecological model recognizes is that um, there are uh, factors of the individual that cannot be negated. Um, but the individual is within a larger context that involves uh, the family, and then outer layers of the social environment and the uh, mi macro social um, environment and, and policies. Um, and that these layers um, are with the individual for the entire lifespan and impact the behavior of, um, of, of all of us. Um, so uh, with that in mind, we decided to um, look at um, each of the um, of these aspects for um, developing the intervention. So we, we had, we knew there was an efficacious intervention out there that we wanted to adapt. So we worked on developing strong partnerships with WIC at the state level, because we were looking beyond the, the pilot. We were looking at um, what, were, what was the chance that this intervention could eventually lead to changes in the way that WIC operates. Can the intervention be developed in the regular um, activities that, that we um, uh, implement? Um, so we established those partnerships, um, strengthened our local partnerships, and um, then moved on to trying to understand better what the setting um, had to offer. What were the challenges in the setting? We did um, key informal interviews with um, uh, six different settings, settings in, in, in the area of Worcester and the surrounding towns. And we um, basically interviewed uh, program directors, um, staff, uh, nutritionists, and um, uh, summarized the, the data, brought it back to them, um, identified that there was interest, identified that um, some sites had actually tried to develop programs <coughs> that never really went very far because of uh, lack of attendance or um, lack of resources. Um, and then we moved on to one, trying to understand the population. So we did um, uh, five or six focus groups with um, women from different sites, trying to understand what motivates them, what their concerns are, and learning from them as to what they would prefer and what, what would be their preferences for, for weight loss. And, um, and what types of things they would want to see and what, what are the things that they would be willing to participate in. Um, so we used all of the information from all these um, um, resources to um, modify the intervention and, um, and then um, to, to, to pilot test it and then to refine it. So we know that research involves testing feasibility, it involves um, effect, testing effectiveness, and then um, implementing and, and disseminating the research. So um, the first star intervention, as I mentioned before, it, it ended up being eight sessions. Again, the number of sessions, everything was informed by um, the three, um, sort of like the three levels of partnership with, with the state, with the local uh, uh, programs, as well as from the participants. So eight sessions were delivered by WIC nutritionists because we wanted to make sure that this was not a, a specialized program that was just going to be require um, psychologists and uh, behavioral experts. Um, it, it needed to be delivered in the site. Um, and um, it, it, we also used a model that had the, that we identified during the uh, key informal interviews, which is the peer model that uh, WIC has used for 
um, uh, fostering um, uh, breastfeeding. And it has been very successful. So we incorporated a, a peer to be another woman that was already receiving services that has been successful with weight loss. Um, we um, developed a um, detailed uh, provider manual and trained the nutritionists in uh, delivering the um, intervention, mm -hmm. trained the peers, and um, developed tailored uh, participant materials. Again, women um, during the focus groups, for example, told us things like, um, it, it would be difficult to engage in physical activity because who would take care of my children? So uh, since we did is creating activities that involve the children so that the children are part of the, what they are doing uh, for, for, for being more active. So the children were used as weight for resistance exercises. Um, they were used for um, uh, encouraging the woman to run um, because part of the um, motivations that the women had were that um, they, they felt too tired and, and too heavy to chase after the children. If they had literally difficulties moving around. So um, we used their same information and that became part of the program in terms of how to um, modify the messages. Mm -hmm. um, we um, used the community linkages that um, the uh, organizations had and that the women uh, knew about to um, facilitate behavior change. So for example, we um, um, conducted the sessions at the youth center in Worcester, which is um, and geographically um, uh, very close to the, the base center to the weak sites. And um, we used the, the YWCA, uh, um, we purchased um, uh, corporate memberships. And um, those memberships allowed women to uh, a certain number of women to engage, to, to attend the, the Y uh, at any given time. And uh, we provided resources. Meals usually attract people. So there was always a meal demonstration at the sessions. And um, the demonstration also included discussion about um, what they would change, what types of things they would do differently. Um, we um, provided transportation um, when needed and childcare. So the women would be um, in their groups uh, in this room and next door their children were being um, taken care of. <coughs> and the babies could be with them. So we identified that um, there were numerous facilitators and challenges um, to this um, implementing, to implementing this intervention and to its sustainability. So we know some of the lessons were that aligning with the program goals and resources was critical. There would not, it would not have been possible uh, to do this without doing without that type of an alignment. Um, so it, it, it's a process that takes time engaging um, um, your um, uh, public health um, uh, partners and engaging the local community-based organizations, but um, it is certainly a necessary uh, factor to really understand what's the reality and what can be done in a regular setting. Um, so we use uh, resources and leverage on resources that WIC was already providing and um, exercise opportunities that um, the health centers were using because the, the idea for the uh, uh, use of the YWCA actually came from the health centers where the WIC um, uh, sites operate. So um, they use that for their patients and even for their staff. So this became uh, part of the, uh, of the intervention. Um, very important to um, obtain input from all the relevant parties, again, uh, to develop the intervention because it ensures that there are not going to be conflicts later on in terms of messages that are being delivered um, or, um, or blocks in terms of the implementation of, of a program. And um, in terms of uh, leveraging organizational resources, we um, identified um, uh, that it was important for the nutritionists that are delivering the services to um, uh, to be the ones that talk to the women and that um, refer the women into the program. Um, so um, by engaging them from the very beginning in the design of the program, we were able to uh, facilitate their referral as well. Um, we learned
learned um, or relearned what, what we anticipated uh, that these women were going to be very busy, um, but uh, we didn't expect that there would be so little support for weight loss among uh, many of them. In some cases, we had women that came and told us, my husband is very upset, I'm losing weight, told me that, told me that I, he didn't marry me to have a barrier at home. I mean, that's the type of comment that some women were getting. Um, there was some um, uh, uh, jealousy. Um, there were a number of other issues. So socially, the, 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 um, um, the situation at home was very much uh, not encouraging of weight loss. Um, but the intervention was delivered in groups, and the women were actually um, um, they found the, the, the um, engagement with other women very helpful. For example, some of the women would uh, find a time um, with other members of their group to attend the, um, the, the why. So they would exercise together. And even if, if they had little time, they, they made sure that they went when other women were going to be there. Um, anticipating and preparing for uh, system changes is, is certainly critical. So we knew that we would need to, to train the staff um, because um, they may not be familiar with uh, things like motivation and interviewing, or with um, um, you know just key things for uh, key you know evidence-based principles of, of weight loss um, interventions, um, and uh, so we did that. We um, had to uh, oversee the fidelity of the intervention and space, and we know uh, we saw that fidelity is challenging because um, the nutritionists um, have in the regular job they are not necessarily counseling their uh, WIC um, uh, participants. They are um, telling them what to do. So um, what we found is that we really needed to train from the very beginning about, you know, what is behavior change? How does behavior change happen? You know, why um, is it counterproductive to tell somebody what to do? And uh, how do you get to engage women and, and, uh, and use their motivations to guide the change as opposed to your motivations? So we found that that was very helpful. Yet when there would be uh, situations in the sessions that a participant would ask a question, uh, should I be taking my uh, multivitamins, for example? Um, then the, it was like if the um, uh, nutritionist would lose track of what they were supposed to be doing, forget the manual, and go on uh, a speech about why multivitamins is this or the other. Or, uh, so it, we know that that, is still, that was a challenge. And um, uh, attendance um, of the women improves. Uh, it was much better than the previous study, but it was still at 60%. So we know that the intervention needed to be um, improved. So um, we um, evaluated all of this and um, have been working on revamping that intervention. Um, uh, and we are funded now to do a um, randomized clinical trial. And um, the intervention is going to be um, tested against a control condition. And uh, we are trying to address <coughs> a, a few things. One is that in the, the previous, uh, the pilot study, we only measured six months. Um, so now we're going to follow the women for 12 months. Um, we are going to address uh, the different uh, challenges at the participant, the staff, and the system level by um, uh, a, a, novel, a novel approach of using narrative in the intervention. So um, I've used, in, in the past, I have used um, um, uh, novellas, uh, video novellas, or red novellas to um, help um, uh, patients with very low literacy uh, to um, uh, understand concepts that are difficult and also to model a behavior change. Uh, so what um, we are doing in this particular study is we are using um, uh, narratives of women who have lost weight to uh, serve as models to the women that are going to be participating in the trial. So, they, so they, they, um, their stories become the core of the intervention. We're still using everything else, but now we have this guiding the intervention so that the narrative is shown and then the nutritionist is, most, is mostly uh, using the motivation and the UN strategies um, to communicate everything else, uh, guided by the, by the narrative. And um, 
uh, we believe that that also may help us address the issue of um, participant engagement because the women may, by observing these other women in, the, um, in, in their uh, storytelling, uh, they may actually increase their uh, attachment to the intervention. So we will, we will see. Um, this is all our hypothesis. So we, um, at this point, we are um, um, just selecting the uh, story units that are um, being um, uh, put together into the videos that are gonna be used at each session based on the stories are selected based on the topics that they address and the type of strategies for each of the sessions. And um, we uh, basically the uh, storytellers for those videos were the women who participated in the pilot study. So, um, so as someone mentioned before, it's sort of like going from um, the uh, 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 efficacy to the effectiveness intervention, then back to the uh, you know using the feedback from the, from those outcomes to, to to improve the interventions that, that we're delivering. Um, and again, with dissemination in mind, we, um, uh, we have manualized uh, materials and um, a man manualized protocol with, with all the intervention materials that, that um, were developed um, as well. Questions? <laughs> We have eight minutes for question. You did very yeah. good with time. <laughs> so question, comment for Dr. Mitai. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Uh, was the first week um, project funded, or did you get the funding for the second one? Now? For the pilot study, mm -hmm. uh, the pilot study was funded through a community-based, or um, it was funded by a community. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just, um, it's, it's, um, but it was like by the organization and then Yes, it was an organization and um, the funding was for uh, $50,000. And then you took the pilot data and submitted it to NIH? Yes. And now you got the... Yes. And that's that's the, the, we yes. have week here, the week program, mm -hmm. and that I think it would be very interesting when we uh, talk about collaborative projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Question, comments? Just to say that's exactly what we did with Lifestyle Matters. We got a small, we got 50,000 pounds, probably about $70,000. And then we did a, a feasibility study, and then we used the results of that to apply for the big grant for Lifestyle Matters. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every other one, everything I've had is always, you know, getting the little money somewhere, right. getting, you know, the, the CTSA is very helpful because we have um, community engagement grants, which are about $12,000. Uh, we have uh, larger grants, like I have another study with um, pregnant women um, that received um, $100,000 for two years. Um, and that was very helpful because we gathered so much data, we got now several studies that are being proposed from just from those data. Um, so, um, you know, institutional funding and, and external funding, I had another study um, that was funded by the American Diabetes Association. Uh, I think it was also $50,000. That was a few years back. And that uh, brought two R1s. Other comments? I would like to make a comment that you were saying, um, and I have talked this with Ivan, Dr. Ivan Gandara, she's a nutritionist, um, of the importance of what you're saying that giving the practical aspect of, you know, because they saw the, par the pyramid of, we know, the 150 minutes, we know what we should or should not eat. But I think people, at least, you know, the, the general population needs to know, as you say, when you talk, if I have $10 and I go to the supermarket and I don't have, a, here, strawberries will cost you $6. So I'm gonna have $4 for the rest of the meal. What can I do with those $5? So if you can elaborate a little on how you really go to the practical aspect, we have a, a a scholar who was here a while who's a fat, she's an exercise, and she said, you should bring your little weights to your work or while you're watching TV. And I ha actually have my weights, I don't know if I but I have it. And, and I said, why did I watch TV? But if she hadn't told me that, I wouldn't know. So how do you deal with that and how can you right. give it? Right, so, um, we, um, so the, the uh, interventions, behavioral interventions have uh, the intervention goals, but the, the process of um, the evidence-based 
in, um, strategies or involve setting goal that the person wants to um, uh, to do. So like um, telling somebody, you know, use weights because that's gonna be good for you. It's never gonna happen. But asking the, the person, um, you know, or, or you know, sharing with the person, especially when the sharing happens among the participants, um, somebody says, you know, I did this. So the, that generates from other people interest, how did you do it? So there's some modeling effects that happen. So we use uh, uh, a lot of these um, interventions as friends and the, the social cognitive um, uh, theory, which, which um, assumes or, or is on their premise that um, uh, a lot of the learning that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, the behavioral learning, happens because we model after others. So it may be sometimes uh, somebody says, well, I don't know how I would do that. So uh, the facilitator would say something like, um, uh, well, do you know anybody who does it? Or does anybody in this group know that, that do it? And, and then if they do, how do you do How do you go about it? And then that generates discussion that is a lot of modeling among peers, um, which brings the, the issue of um, a culture, because these are all women from many, many different cultures. So we capitalize on the fact that there is a, the culture is, um, Culture is a very general concept, but um, there is also there are also many subcultures within cultures, um, and there are many themes that are very similar across cultures. So in this case, we um, leverage on the concept of um, uh, motherhood, having a small child. Most of these women in the um, focus groups uh, basically told us that their main motivation to lose weight was to be good mothers. That. The, I mean, nobody said, uh, I want to be healthy. Uh, nobody said, I want to avoid diabetes in the future. Nobody said, I don't want to die of a stroke. Nobody said anything like that. They are just thinking about their, you know, their children and what the example they are giving their children. And so that was the main motivator and what was emphasized constantly. So if somebody was saying, uh, you know, I don't, uh, and these are all principles of motivation in the view, and somebody says, well, I, I didn't do my assignment this week, I really, you know, um, I, I felt lazy, and so. So the, the, um, uh, addressing that discrepancy with the original goals the woman had told us includes things like, um, um, well, how does that, um, how do you feel about it, given the values that you have shared with us, the values of you want to be a good mother, um, uh, you know, your family is important to you. Well, and what would you like to do about it? So that again puts the board on their court about what it is that they want to set as a more realistic goal for themselves, and so on. Does that answer? Clemente Diaz and then este Dr. Palacios. Do you think using the peer uh, as a counselor or a facilitator behavior change no. or you know, helping achieve behavior change? Uh, within the concept of other intervention uh, model, uh, within the scope of Latinos, do you find that generational issues come into play that the peer uh, being older, more experienced versus younger, uh, is a difference, makes a difference? Yeah, we didn't try um, older people from the community. We tried, you know, peers defined by they have been at WIC mm -hmm. and they have, um, they are about the same socioeconomic status, um, uh, you know, daily routines, concerns, and so on. So I, I actually don't know. I believe there is somebody in Hartford who may be doing any, you know, work on the, on the intergenerational, but that's a, that's a very, interesting question because um, uh, although it may vary by culture, because some cultures are a lot more, you know, value older people a lot more than others. Um, so in the Latino culture, that probably would be um, appropriate. I don't know in other cultures what, how much, I know the American culture in general, uh, you know, people don't necessarily see their parents as the source of wisdom. Uh, uh, whereas we tend to do that, we tend to look up to our elders. Yeah, last comment and a question with the other. So did you ask um, this participant what was from your intervention, what was the most or the strategy that they liked the most or that helped them the most to achieve weight loss? Um 
we we did ask um, because we did the uh, interviews for the development of the stories. So we did ask, and I'm, I don't think that I could identify one single. Um, um, I don't think that, that there was any one single aspect of it. I think that most women talked about all the different components of the intervention and, and what they do or did not do with them. Um, I can tell you that um, one of the more uh, challenging, there are two challenging things to do um, with um, low income, uh, low literate uh, populations uh, that have been pretty uh, similar across from in, in all my, my work. And those are uh, self-monitoring, and the second one is goal setting. And um, self-monitoring, I think that it is not actually self-monitoring is, is probably a, a common issue for most populations um, because it involves paying attention, and especially paying attention to something that um, is causing you a problem and you don't want to see. <laughs> Um, so, I, so we manage it more from a psychological perspective in terms of, um, uh, you know, asking people again to reflect on why they are there in the intervention and what they want to do about their difficulty doing that, and let them come up with their solutions. Uh, and people find solutions, and some do it more than others. Um, but when they once they start to see the, the results, then things change. But it's really the beginning. Um, and they both say, I think that it's probably related to um, educational level that, you know, the more, the sort of, um, the more you progress in your education, the more practice you get at setting goals for yourself. So if somebody has not had those experiences or opportunities, it's a lot tougher to understand the concept of a goal. I remember many years ago um, when I first was working on this, um, I was doing some, um, some uh, focus groups with um, lat older Latinos with um, diabetes. And um, we were comparing the uh, physician's expectations and experiences with the patient's expectations and experiences. And uh, when we got to the, to the idea of goal setting, um, the uh, you know I thought well maybe I don't have there were a lot of Puerto Ricans in that in, in that area and I thought maybe I don't have the right goals for goals in Spanish and um, so we used a variety of, of words and at the end somebody um, said oh is that like a New Year's resolution like <laughs> and then he added I remember perfectly his, his face uh, he added. Oh, you know, the things that we say we're going to do that we never do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Rosario. I forgot to mention that Dr. Rosario is from Venezuela, so that's why we're partnered with Hispanic also. So thank you. We're in now. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. And now we are going to uh, complete the closing remark with Dr. Estape, please, I mean, Dr. Garcia. that we are going to define in a better way tomorrow morning in the session that we're going to have at the Club de la Facultad. Is that the early That what? Is that the early Yes. But we have the list in the registration uh, table. If anyone wants to go, please sign, just to be sure that we're going to have people or how many. Let me see if we can. Thank you.
Remember the topic. Okay, we're going to start with Dr. Esta P. No, okay. Okay. Uh, according with them, with her, her guest speaker, and what you see, some closing remarks that contribute to define new collaboration from the perspective of your endowment. Um, first, I think that the meeting has been excellent. We have learned a lot. We have shared a lot. Um, there are some points that um, I think that are important for us um, that we can get through you know, all the, the whole discussion that we have. So first, I think that um, we need to look at things um, from different perspectives. Um, I think that the presentation that Dr. Fernando Mendoza gave um, talking about the economic implications of the health disparities, not just for today, not just for uh, tomorrow, not just for today, but for tomorrow, uh, give us a, another way to look at the same problem. And there are many ways that we can we can we can look um, at the same um, the same problem. And I think that something that we need to to think about is what are the other issues that we should be talking about regarding the same issues that we have. There was another concept that was um, important, and, and, I, and, and also from Dr. Mendoza conference, and was the resiliency concept. Um, what makes people to be healthy, even in the presence of poverty? And sometimes we want to focus on what is need. We, sometimes we need to, we want to focus on the negative aspects, but Talking about looking at things from a different perspective, there is a need to look at the positive things that our populations, that our communities can give uh, to this whole process of understanding and eliminating health disparities. Um, I really love the concept of transparency through the communications. Um, and I think that we need to uh, there to be open and there to challenge ourselves, not just with what we know, but what are our own prejudices and what are our own limitations in order to be effective um, during um, the research and the investigations that we want to do in the area of health disparities. We do that successful models of interventions um, and something that um, I like about um, uh, the presentations that uh, Dr. Guillermo gave was that we don't need to reinvent the rule, the, the, the wheel. We don't need to reinvent the rule. There are some opportunities to replicate successful models that, and, and make them culturally appropriate. And, and I think that we that have interest in doing uh, research and interventions to eliminate health disparity, we need to look at successful models in other way, in other in other parts, and how we can actually um, make use of the knowledge that is available and translate that knowledge into our communities. Um, and that was another concept that uh, we just saw with um, the examples of building evidence through the whole process of the whole spectrum of translation. Um, we need to be able to translate our knowledge, but we also be, need to be able to um, uh, identify our facilitators and what are, gonna, what are our challenges. And I think that the Society is an excellent example of that. And something that is very important is that we need to be trained. Um, um, we need to make use of the opportunities that we have available, not just for Training and Joyce uh, make a, a good example of some of the training process that they done have done in Mayo Clinic regarding um, courses in health disparities. But also we need to be trained through the in-service learning experiences and working with projects with the community. And so there are many opportunities to engage in projects that respond to the needs of the communities that we serve. So I think that um, 
this has been a very, very good um, day. And I hope that you have many questions and many um, challenges for, uh, for yourself. And we expect that we can uh, continue exploring possibilities for collaborations and, and to develop successful partners, partnerships too, and in the campus part. of expertise, uh, I want to uh, destacar, um, oh my god, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> okay, first, uh, uh, I like very much the, the, the beginning with the concept of Dr. Uh, Mendoza about the economic cause of disparities, because in the kind of world that we live, we need to consider cause and we need to consider how we can make something with that. Uh, we need to consider, in my case, I, I work a lot with models of health promotions and framework. Uh, the use of models already in place. You know, we need to know which are the models. Uh, we need to redefine our model of health and the definition that we have of that and how we are uh, Envisioning health, that was the, the beginning of the presentation. Uh, we need to start using the correct world. It meant when we are talking about themes and we are going to work with research, when we don't say translation or themes and, and, and start using all the, 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 the concepts that we need to uh, use. We need to evaluate our own uh, models, our own programs, and use our health promotion design to develop new proposal. Uh, it was very interesting uh, when Dr. Mendoza presented the, the health promotion program, Echale, mm -hmm. and, and then say that go through an R, R1 proposal. We have a lot of information, a lot of pilot projects, but we, we didn't work with that in, in the way maybe that we need. Uh, we need to create more community campus campus partnership and call that partnership. So how we can get that? Joyce bring the idea and Cheryl give the idea and uh, work with healthy literacy because we are Hispanic, we are Puerto Rican, and we use different terms and understand things in a different way. I work with uh, human sexuality, and now we're going to start uh, uh, research about what people uh, understand for or the definition of sex for a better uh, service to people. We need to uh, develop partnership between health services provided. Uh, Rosal brings a very good example. They use the association. Other group, more than NIH, DVC, the federal office, and we can start with that if we don't have the opportunity to write a, write a proposal. Uh, Dr. Gavier used the word provocative. We need to be more provocative. We need to try new things. And all the models, framework that Joyce presents, we need to work with that. Because to design, we need to use the model already in place. And sometimes we want just to design with my idea or just with the focus group, but we need to combine practice and theory. This is very important. And to finish, uh, I need to think a little more about what you say. You say, uh, you use the term community in need instead of the need of community. And, and I would like to go more deep in that. And what Dr. Uh, Gail say that I think that is very important, I work with community for 30 years. What we do when things recommended by policies, because we, we work with policies, regulation, law, uh, letter of understanding, what we do when uh, policy do not, or people don't move on with the thing that the policy say. And we have a lot of things right in place and nobody knows nothing about that. And I think that for community engagement and community development, we need to 
start looking in a different way. Thank you. I just, um, I'm just looking at the faces of the people that are staying here, and that, let me see what time it is. It's 3.20. So everyone that is still here, I think, uh, has a lot of vision. <laughs> and I love the word uh, revisioning the causes of disparities, and I always, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, getting the funding writing the proposals, and that's one of the things that I love the most. And I was thinking, and I would like to hear from all of you, because what we are doing today is uh, for the fifth summit, and for the next grant that we're gonna write, probably two or three or four, I don't know how many. And I learned uh, from the Puerto Rico Clinical and Translational Research Consortium that we still have Jose there. And Maria, I, do we have people from UCC? Ah, yes, Maurice is there, good. Because when you work with partners, uh, you grow more, and uh, uh, now the postdoctoral master has 10 partners, and I think that what the NIH is looking into funding is not inventing the wheel, but is, uh, like uh, you all said, uh, repeating the, the models that work. And I think that the organizers, the committee that organized this uh, meeting, I really congratulate all of you, Lourdes and Emil and, and the group, Anastasia, everyone, Barbara, everyone who, who chaired. I mean, I, I knew Sharin very well, right? So, but uh, I met Mendoza today. I think I met him like 30 years before, maybe, who knows? Uh, then, um, I learned that Gail is a belly dancer. <laughs> ah, yes. I said I can shake well, but she goes like that very good too. And then, you know, Joy, uh, yes, she has been working with us in the course. And then Milagros, I have heard her, you know, as a mentor of Ada. So I think that our scholars that are still here, uh, what we want to do is uh, centers or organizations that can work. Like I was telling, uh, where is Arnaldo still here? No. no, Arnaldo and Karen, I mean, they're trying to do this center in, in fear and anxiety, and then Farah is trying to do another center to, to then we have another um, scholar that wants to do a center in Alzheimer's. So I think that if we continue, we have to come out from here with ideas that we can write proposals, that we can uh, have partners like all of you here and uh, think how we can join. So that idea of tomorrow of dividing the three groups, one looking into the area of pediatrics, the other one in aging, and the other one is uh, in community research. But I think that I went to a meeting that that's when I learned about the implementation science I went to Academy Health for the first time. I didn't know even that existed. But I went to Academy Health, and that's where I got the idea of doing, we're trying to do with Mary Helen a, a manuscript about implementation science. And then I learned the importance of patient-centered outcomes research. And I think that uh, patient-centered outcomes research, community-based, and we're trying to go into health services. And then, like, we said, like I said, we have three endowments. We have a lot of money that NIH has put into this university, at least into the campus. So I think that from today, I would like to hear, and Emma is here, and, and Emma has been working a lot with research and proposals, and we have all of you here a lot, uh, partners. So I think that uh, I would like to hear from you, uh, how do you think that uh, if these three ideas that we're gonna be working tomorrow, or if you have any other ideas, or centers, please, we have an endowment, and the endowment is for infrastructure. And uh, the more money we have in the balance, the more interest it gains. And we have to use that money to, to grow. You know, we have to put that so that it, it builds on, on more projects. So that's why we are creating this phase three and uh, the strategic plan is only for three years. So, you know, when we have uh, now we think what we can do next, 
And uh, I'm so happy that uh, the Enid and, and Princess and the whole group that they have. I just visited the Hospital Carolina. They have great facilities. So I think the endowments, we have to get together and try to see how we can build more and get more funding. So I would like to hear from you if anyone has wants to say something before we go closing. Uh, what, Clemente and then, is that Wilfredo? Yes. Ah, okay, well, let me, should I let Wilfredo first? Wilfredo, we're going to give you the first before Clemente. Uh, he's a scholar, 2000 what? 2005. Yes, yes. okay. I appreciate the kind of thing here. They have been a very uh, excellent and you wanna come in marvelous room? No, I didn't forget it. Yeah. 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 Ah, but okay, they, they, they hear you well. <laughs> so I really appreciate the opportunity of being here because this has been a marvelous event. Um, and so, so my interest is on cancer clinical and disparities research. And, and, and it is interesting field in terms of the clinical disparities. Uh, and we have here learned a lot about experiences doing research in the continental US. But uh, we are all, I mean, mostly, and most of the people in Puerto Rico are Hispanics based on the census. Uh, uh, we are 99% Hispanics. But uh, there are clinical disparities within the island. Mm -hmm. So there are socioeconomic disparities. Mm -hmm. uh, people, people from the northern Puerto Rico may have different uh, health and disease experiences as compared to those in central Puerto Rico, as compared to those in the southern Puerto Rico. So I think that a next step it would be like to have uh, a symposium of actual uh, clinical disparities research in Puerto Rico so that we can uh, know and learn the status of that in the island and we can plan on things to solve them in the future. That's a good idea. You can be the, the next chair of the organizing committee of the Health <laughs> Disparity <laughs> Meeting in Puerto Rico for okay. this. Uh, yes, now you know. <laughs> we look for a date. The first thing you do when you plan something is put a date. So you have your commitment already. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Wilfredo. That's a very good idea. Clemente. Just, uh, it's not meant to be a closing remark, but it, uh, I think it's a wonderful black word we can write on and tomorrow pursue uh, things that concretely can take over for next year. I think it's, it's very good if we really take that tangible, concrete effort that will join us. And I think we were discussing, Estella and I, that certainly uh, even better when, when we can think of people who are younger and that will come into the, uh, into the scenario with a lot of energy and they can take these and we can help out in that respect. So I think yes, it just that like Clemente and I were talking at lunch that uh, we, we are really, we love it, right? We would love to continue, but I think we have to be now the, the mentors of the That's new exactly generation right. and, and being consultants and helping you write and being the PIs because we have a lot of ideas, but we're so committed. So all of you uh, that are there with energies and ideas, we all, the seniors, would be there for it to help you. So we have to, Sherin and Milagros, which one? I mean, uh, just a suggestion, a quick one, not really a uh -huh. remark either. Um, Clemente wanted me to say more about Picori than I did, but I wondered how much this group has looked at the funding opportunities from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research no. Institute because mm -hmm. they're, they have, they, we have, you know, something like three and a half billion dollars to give away mm -hmm. in a period of time, it, you know, it has to be, it has to be funded by, I can't remember, but it, we have a defined period of time, time uh, uh, for statute. And so that's a, a good lot of those opportunities align with some of the things that you were saying. So, so that would be very interesting if there, because we have to look for places where there is funding available. Yeah. 
milagros. That's a very good idea too. Uh, Dr. Mendoza. So I guess I would say that one of the issues I've learned is you have a lot of commitment. The question is, do the politicians have that commitment? Mm -hmm. Oh, here, Puerto Rico? We change every four years. <laughs> <laughs> when you're trying to get them with you, then they change again. But, but, but I think the issue is that what has to be in that context. Yeah. You know, otherwise, uh, you know, they're the tail and we get away. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is the important future for Puerto Rico, what happens to the children. And oh, with it. well, I, I should not have said that. I think that uh, we have a lot of organizations. I thought that when I wrote down, I think that there's more support from the organizations or the advocacy groups and that uh, politicians make change when they see uh, the pressure of the people. Like we had um, a project here in, in our school for children with disabilities and that we had to close. And uh, the only way it was open it was because the parents uh, became active and, be and went to the legislature. So I think that getting the communities involved, that's why I think it's so important, the communities involved and the patient organizations like Susan Coleman and all the other organizations because they make pressure. I think they do. I think we are all the academicians. They think that we are in, you know, living in another Torre de Marfil. <laughs> they don't listen. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. Joy. Well, the, the one thing that I think is really pivotal that we, we've discovered today is the fact that all of our presentations were interconnected. You know, there was a common theme that was that was seen throughout. You know, being thoughtful, being open to change, mm -hmm. being progressive, um, and being willing to work with a variety of partners. So, with that, you know, as a junior investigator myself, you know, to be able to come and speak with to this group, you know, is humbling. Um, and it, so thank you again for that opportunity. And I think our next step is really thinking about how can we also build the infrastructure here at UPR, but also at our other, at the other partner oh, yes. it has to be. You know, because one of the things that I have as a challenge is that my budget is shrinking, but the workload is increasing. <laughs> so how do we, you know, how do we work together, you know, to make sure that we're able to continue these efforts. That's good to hear that it's happening in Mayo because we think it's only here. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, the thing is to grow together. It's not only benefit for one side. Exactly. And uh, I do, I, I think that these summits, every time that we have had it, the first thing we had was the conference. That's why the clinical research conference came up from the program, then the summit came, in the development of the course. And this going into the fifth when we were thinking what, what we are gonna do. I mean, last night there was a lot of talk about uh, Hispan Latin America expanding our borders to Latin American countries, but then I thought about Gail, we have to include England. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, Latin America, I mean, Spain, Portugal, so it's really global. And the problems that we have, I mean, we are humans, we are all humans, so it, it, I think it, we have to see that. Bye, Um Maybe to share in and the rest, um, I was discussing uh, after Dr. Mendoza finished that one of the things that worried me uh, when we talk about grants from NIH or for that matter, uh, first of for us as universities to compete with other, maybe Seven. more competitive, is very difficult. And then when you see these proposals and we go into the, lit the literature, 
uh, to find studies that when we look here in Puerto Rico, then we will look Hispanic and when we look at Hispanic, what it do is uh, 90% Mexican or something. So my worry is, or what can we do to try to, not obligate, but to, because when I, I have reviewed proposal and, uh, proposals and then they have, well, we're gonna, tr we're gonna recruit 10% of Hispanics and then they come, well, we tried, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what, it, it should be kind of, you know, it's, you have to make it happen or you have to collaborate and, and one last thought on that. Um, over uh, Susan Common Board here in Puerto Rico the other day, uh, a, a member said there's this investigator who was very frustrated applying to common fund in the state because they cannot compete. Mm -hmm. So I have a conference call next week to discuss that and said either you guys make a proposal for minority institutions or you have to let us, you know, mm -hmm. put it like a, a requirement mm -hmm. that you have to collaborate with mine because it's not gonna happen. And then breast cancer is something that is really different in, in, in <laughs> the union. And if we don't have the money, we're just basing all our treatment on Mexicans or, or other Latin people that are not Puerto Rican. So what can we do and maybe well, you have to first? And, and I guess that's why I suggest, and this may not be the answer to everything, just because it was my life for so many years, but uh, that's why I suggest to Corey, if you, if you know about it, you know, it, w it came out of the statute, the affordable care statute, and it was defined specifically as an institute that was uh, non-governmental. So it's not part of NIH, it's not part of anything else. It has to be independent. And the reason it wanted to be, it, it was defined that way is because their goal is to recruit not the usual suspects in terms mm -hmm. of investigators and investigative groups. Mm -hmm. And to really be able to reach out into communities that haven't been on the inside of NIH mm -hmm. and other, other places. Uh, now, having said that, the research method still has to be mm -hmm. really, really strong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in order to make those two parts mm -hmm. balance, um, the methodology committee, which I chaired, kind of created a methodology report, which actually specified, in order to compete, these are the kind of methodologic standards that you need to abide by. So they are trying to do things differently. They're trying to pull in different groups as investigators and uh, to address questions that you know the usual suspects have not been able to uh, 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 address. And one last comment, mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why a couple of you, I mean, if, I would encourage you to do that, can't go to Washington and meet with them and say, here are the issues around Puerto Rico. How do we, how do we get engaged? We have these endowments. I mean, go meet with them. They're very open to it. Um, Joe Selby is uh, the scientific, uh, uh, lead scientific administrator. He's a great, I mean, I can connect you if you like. Uh, he used to be uh, at Kaiser. And but I so think the answer, the answer is partnerships. I mean, I think that uh, now more and more, uh, when you make real partnerships and work together for a goal, I mean, it's more diverse. There are different disciplines, different thoughts, different experiences. So I really appreciate that Lourdes is going to do the closing. <laughs> well, I feel that a partnership is very important because the contact that you have is not the one that I have, and maybe we can be in touch in different ways. Uh, well, we have some idea, but tomorrow morning from 8 to 12, we're going to have the, uh, a working breakfast from 8 to 10 with a panel discussion with the lecturer that we have today, and they're going to present, follow some guidelines that we bring before, some um, question, uh, their idea, concrete idea, and how the, the group can develop or present or include more idea to develop. Then from 10 to 12, we're gonna have the working groups. The community engagement and the one with uh, elderly intervention is gonna be at the Club de la Facultad, faculty club that is in the other building, and the one that is going to work with pediatricians, uh, pediatric population, uh, will meet in room 844 at the main building. At the main building, for me, at the main building. Yes, but after 10. Everybody is invited, but we have already some, one, some list in place, but anyone that wants to participate, let us know. Well, thank you for your participation. I see. The evaluation form, yes, another remember <laughs> request.
Please Another request that you please fill in the evaluation form and leave at the registration desk. Well, thank you very much, and now we're going to have some networking at the terrace. At the terrace. Eight yes. Hours terrace. Yes. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Yeah.